Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, folks. My name is Lyle. I'm an alcoholic. Um, this is my second meeting for the day. It's that one this morning. And uh, the other day when I was talking about this, I thought, I remember the first time I ever said my name was Lyle and I'm an alcoholic. And I don't know that I've had a greater personal struggle than to finally put that word in the same sentence as my name. And that was a difficult thing for me to do. Uh, my sobriety date is March the 7th of 1990. <clears throat> So I've been around a little while, and uh, what I've kind of started doing, uh, just because it's a little bit different, is, and I don't know how many newcomers are in this particular group, but I've heard a lot, I've heard a fair number of people say, you know, thank God they got to AA, and they, they went in, and they sat down, they listened, and they knew that they were home, they were where they needed to be, and and I've always been kind of amazed at that because that, that's not the way I started off. And I will tell you that um, my introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous came in 1975. I was living in Minnesota. And I was a young pilot for Northwest Airlines. And I'd gotten a DWI. And uh, a DWI back in 1975 was not what, what they are today. It was certainly not the end of the world. It wasn't a fun experience, but it wasn't the end of the world. And I knew um, I, I knew some people that had DWIs, and uh, and typically what they did was they got an attorney, and they went into the courtroom where he talked with the judge, and the standard deal at that time was a three hundred dollar fine and um, and a reduction in charges to careless driving, and then if you had a car that was impounded, you got your car and you went on your way. So I went into the courtroom that morning expecting that was what was going to happen. I wasn't happy to have a DWI, but it certainly wasn't the end of my life. So I went in there, and um, this judge, this particular judge, may even have been a member of this fellowship because he said, no, that's not the way it was going to work out. He was going to, he would allow that to happen, but only if I agreed to go to Alcoholics Anonymous for a year. And I got to tell you, I was I was outraged by that. I was just incredibly angry that he would suggest such a thing. I saw no need for it, and uh, and it was so far out of the norm that uh, first initially I told my lawyer, no, there was no way I was going to do that. And then I said, well, let me think about it a little bit. The FAA here in the United States was not cross-checking pilot licenses and DWI arrest at that point in time. So that was not a factor, but I, I finally decided, well, I don't, I really don't want that on my record. So I, I reluctantly, angrily agreed to go do this. So I went to an AA meeting for, uh, for the first time, and I was not in that AA meeting very long, maybe five minutes, as I sat there and I looked around the room and I listened to some of the people that were talking, some of the conversation, and I very quickly recognized that I was in the middle of a cult and that this these people that were so adamant about alcohol and were talking so much about it were very clearly brainwashed cult members and I had absolutely no business sitting in that room I did not belong there at all and uh, so I figured out a way to circumnavigate this whole thing and that is that Wherever we flew into, it didn't make any difference what city or town that we flew into. I would get in my hotel room even before I'd get on my uniform and I'd get the hotel, I'd get the phone book and I'd look up the local AA thing and I'd get the address and the phone number and then I'd create a meeting, fictitious meeting around this. Now, I didn't have to have anybody signing for me. I, I just had to turn in a list of AA meetings that I was supposed, supposedly attending and I'm not sure how many it was, maybe three a week or something like that. So. Uh, everywhere I go, I'm I'm creating all these fictitious meetings. And then about once a month, I tell my wife, well, I better go to a meeting in case somebody has to say they saw me there. And I got to tell you, I had to gird up for that. I hated 
AA meetings. I hated AA meetings. I hated the people in AA. I had nothing but contempt and disdain and scorn for them. I thought it was so much nonsense, just nonsense. And I'd go to this meeting, and I had a really bad attitude. And if anybody called me on it, uh, the first thing I wanted to do was was hit them. And uh, I'd have to really restrain myself because I, I had no patience, no time, no tolerance for AA or the people in it. And I just kind of bite my lip. And I get through that hour, which was the longest hour of my life. And then I would come in the door going home. And I would tell my wife, I'd say, that is the most effed up bunch of people I've ever seen in my entire life. I'd say, my God, they lose their homes, their cars, their wives, their kids, their jobs. Then they sit around and talk about it for an hour. And I'd say, for God's sake, let's have a drink. And I'd have, I'd pour a drink as stiff as I could make it. And maybe even two of them just to kind of chill out and settle down after an AA meeting. And that was my introduction to AA. And I maintained that attitude for the next 15 years. Until suddenly, uh, some things happened. And uh, I became that man in the big book when it talks about being beaten into a state of reasonableness. I am that guy. So we fast forward 15 years. Now, I've had a lot of <clears throat> alcohol-related incidents, but I've never had anything that created um, consequences for me. I had had some car accidents. But they were one-car accidents, and I managed to exit the scene before the cops showed up. Nobody got hurt. I got into uh, fights in bars. Um, I woke up in places where I didn't know where I was or how I got there. And uh, I had a lot of blackouts. I'm, uh, I became a blackout drinker. And uh, so I had a lot of blackouts. Twice I lost cars. I didn't know where the car was. I had no idea where it was inside where the in the in the town or the city I was in, I had no idea where that car was. But I didn't I didn't attach any significance whatsoever to any of this. As a matter of fact, my mantra anytime something would happen, I'd go, I'd go, you know, I just shrug and say, well, you know, that could happen to anybody. And a lot of the times that was true until I got into treatment and then I had to do a first step exercise and I looked back, starting with all the events that were alcohol related that had been significantly negative in my life. And I had a couple of pages of those. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, those things could happen to somebody, but they could not all happen to one particular person if they were, if they were a normal drinker. So I began to see a little bit, but, you know, we, we're supposed to talk about what we were like, what happened, what we're like now. So I'm going to start with what happened. And, uh, on, uh, I told you my sobriety date is March the 7th of, uh, 1990, on March the 8th, in the morning, um, an event took place, and, and it created a huge national news event here in the United States. And it went all over the world, it went around. You know, I went to Canada, and I know that it got over to Europe. Um, and that is um, that an airline crew was arrested for having flown from Fargo, North Dakota, to the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul International Airport under the influence of alcohol. And I was the captain of that flight crew. Um, I'm also aware when we do these talks that uh, more times than not, uh, I'm left with the idea. I don't know what the speaker did uh, in terms of a living, uh, because we're telling a recovery story. We're not up here to talk about careers or jobs or anything else like that. So I want you to know that the only reason I even bring up this airline pilot stuff is because it was the thing. It was the one single factor that drove the all of the momentum of my story that, that went all around the United States and stayed on the news forever. Because on March the 8th of 1990, I became the first airline pilot in American commercial aviation history to be arrested for having flown a commercial airliner under the influence of alcohol. Subsequently, I was convicted. I was tried in a federal courtroom. I was convicted. I was sentenced and I was sent to federal prison. And that was the first time that had ever happened in American commercial aviation. And so it was a media event. It was the kind of story the media loves. And it got on the news and it stayed on the news. And it just it, it just dominated the entire news. Almost every news segment was about the new, uh, lead stories about the Northwest Airlines flight crew 650 and those three pilots. And it stayed on the news for a long, 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 long time. 
today I see a, one, if a pilot's arrested, you may see his name or his face or his picture one time, and it's an old story now. And so it's not, it, they fade from the news really quickly. They're not even on there the second day of the news cycle. But I can tell you that as the number one guy, my story was was on the news every single day for a long time, a long time. And I didn't think it was ever going to end. I um, I got home the day after the arrest. I spent 12 hours uh, in the arrest process. And I got to tell you that a lot of most of that, not or maybe not most, but a lot of it, I felt like it was a surreal event. Like I was watching this happen to somebody else. That there was no way possible this could be happening to me because this was not my life. This was not who I was. It was never who I was. I'd had a good life. I'd had a successful life. And I'd come from a very ignominious background where I'd had a lot of success and accomplishments and achievements. And I wasn't I wasn't a falling down drunk. I was you know, used to come coming through life and creating a lot of disgrace and trouble and problems and 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 failing. This was the very antithesis of my entire existence. And so I had a hard time with it. I had a really, really hard time with it. But I can tell you on the morning of March the 8th, when I was arrested, I was destroyed. I mean, it absolutely wiped me out. It went all the way to my bone marrow. This event was just surreal. I couldn't believe it. And then there were times when I'd be looking around me and I'd think, oh, my God, it is happening. It's happening to me and it's happening right now. And it was all I could do to not throw up and get sick. I was so sick at heart. I just couldn't believe this was happening to me. We were released that day. I got home the next morning. And uh, I was supposed to have been home that night, but uh, the trauma and the shock was such that it never occurred to me. I, I was so destroyed. And my wife, Barbara, sat at the airport here in Atlanta for four hours waiting on me to come in that night. And I, when I finally got back to an apartment, I called, and she was still not there. And I left a message and I said, there's been a disaster. I think I've lost my job. I'll be home the first flight in the morning. So I did that. And um, I exited the airport in Atlanta very quickly. I knew the mechanics and baggage handlers and groomers and agents. I knew everybody there that worked out there in the Northwest area. I used to laugh and talk and joke with them. And, and I didn't want anybody to see me or say anything to me or stop me. So I, I got out as quickly as could as I could. And Barbara was out there parked and I saw her. And I've always said that I felt like I had to climb over the curb to get in the car with it. It's now Friday, March the 9th. And uh, we'd been married a long time, and I couldn't even look at her. I was so ashamed, so ashamed. And uh, she pulled away. I, I, I just said in a very defeated way, I said, honey, I'm so sorry. And she's got a very soft voice. And she said, uh, well, who better than I might understand how you feel right now? And we drove home in silence. Later, I saw that, not at the moment, but later I saw that as a gift. I thought, what wife, having learned that her husband just trashed a 22-year golden career as an airline captain, would have said, you know, you've seen this before. Northwest Airlines at that time was the only major carrier that did not have a program for alcoholic pilots. That program dated back to 1973, and all the other major carriers were engaged in that program. It was highly successful, and Northwest had, had, had refused to join the rest of the industry. And, you know, I'd seen pilots get in trouble before over the course of years, maybe three or four or five times. And, and and every time it happened, it was an explosive event at the airlines. And those stories exploded among the pilots and flight attendants and within a day or so. And we heard about it. And over the course of the day of the arrest, I, that one of the millions of thoughts I had was that's where my story goes. That's how my name ends up. Uh, I end up leaving here in that with that hall of shame thing that I'd seen some and uh, not not so many, but a few of the other pilots um, that were that had happened to. So I, I knew what the outcome was, and the shame was just incredible. I used to spend some time on one of these talks trying to ex describe how ashamed I felt, and the big book says it better than I ever will when it talks about pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I don't think it can be said any better than that. Barbara went to work when I got home, and uh, I did not want to be in my own skin. Uh, I was just beside myself. And uh, so I picked the phone up and I called a doctor. He's a PhD family therapist doctor. I didn't know who else to call. And, and I said, there, I need to declare an emergency. It's been, it's been a really bad thing. And he said, come on in, I'll clear the calendar. 
That's a Friday, March the 9th. I'm going to hear two comments that day that neither one of which I can mentally process. So I went into this man's office and I didn't mince words or anything. I, I was done. I, 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 this, this, this event absolutely destroyed me, just destroyed me. So I went in there and I told him straight out what had happened. And then he recoiled in some surprise and he said, God, Lyle, he said, this is horrible. He said, this is absolutely horrible. And he started around his desk and he stopped and he turned to me and I heard the first comment that day that I could not process because he looked at me and he said, but maybe this is what had to happen. And I could not for the life of me figure out why he would say that to me. I had no idea how that fit into anything that we had talked about up to that point, where it came from, why I, I just couldn't connect it to anything. And he left, came back a few minutes later and he said, I, I've got a doctor I want you to go see. He said, I was on staff with him uh, a few years back. He's on the other side of Atlanta. He's a very prominent psychiatrist. He's also a recovering alcoholic and cocaine addict. <clears throat> and he said, and he's certified in addiction medicine. I had never even heard of addiction medicine before. So Barbara and I, and he said, the appointment is 6 o'clock. Now, I knew doctors don't see patients at 6 o'clock on Friday nights. That just doesn't happen. So the idea that he's not going to see me, that conveyed a certain sense of urgency. I was shredded emotionally. But I, I picked up on that. And the doctor who set up the appointment told me later, he said, based on your appearance, he said, I was just really afraid you were a suicide. And it was really imperative that we get you over to see this man just as quickly as we could. So Barbara and I drove over there. And I have no real meet, uh, memory of that meeting. I'd, I hadn't had anything to eat or drink for two days. Uh, so it wasn't a drinking thing, but I just have, it's almost like a blackout that uh, I've had when I was drinking. I know I was there. I remember seeing him and meeting him. I remember talking to him, but I don't remember any of the specifics of that evening. I'm sure he asked me questions that uh, any doctor would with regard to alcoholism. I'm sure he took a family history. But at some point, no, no matter, I don't know if it's 15 minutes or 50 minutes, he looked at me and said, Lolly, you're an alcoholic. You need to get under treatment tonight. And um, and I didn't have a reaction to that. And that was significant because I've hated alcoholics my whole life. You're going to hear this in a little while. But both of my parents are alcoholics. They both died from this. I saw what happened in my family. I saw what happened around the country when I flew around. I saw the drunks, the bums, and the losers that were alcoholics. And uh, in the 24 hours since the arrest, way down deep inside, in a way I'll probably never understand, I, I knew. I, I, I knew before he told me that, that I had become that one thing that I had sworn by God I would never be an alcoholic. And I knew I was. I knew I was. And I said to him, I said, I thought you'd probably tell me that. I'm okay with it. But I said, please let me go home. I said, I, this just happened. And I said, I'd like for Barbara to hang on to me and let my mind uncoil. Let me just absorb what's happened to me, and then I will go into treatment. He said, you need to go into treatment tonight. And I looked at him and took a breath, and I said, okay. So we drove across Atlanta to a treatment center. We made the final turn there, and there was a sign on the corner there. There's still a sign on the corner. It's a different sign, same location, but the headlights swept the sign, and I hit the brakes with the headlights directly on the sign, directly in front of me with the light shining on the sign that said Anchor Hospital, a hospital for alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. The last place on the face of the planet I thought I would ever see is a treatment center for alcoholics. I had never thought I would ever come in close, close or in, in contact. And I sat there, and the reality with the lights on those, on that sign, and I thought, my God Almighty, what ha what's happened to my life? What, what happened here? Because I knew my life was over. I thought, here's where it ends. My life ends tonight in a treatment center for alcoholics. It's over. It's just over. And I couldn't understand what had happened to me. And I had a little quick flashback across the years of all the things that I'd managed to achieve and accomplish, the things that I'd been extraordinarily proud of. And they just flashed by, and then all of a sudden they were gone. And I wasn't even sure at that moment in time if they were real. And I had no, no value as a human being, none. I, I, I just had no value. And we started down the hill into the treatment center. And for the first time that day, it registered on me. This is March the 9th. Today, today, with my life completely, totally, absolutely destroyed, is my 27th wedding anniversary. And I said to Barbara, hell of a way to spend an anniversary, huh? I then heard the, sta soft, the second statement that I couldn't process because very softly she said, might be the best one we ever had. 
And I, for the life of me, I could not, ma- I could not imagine how she could manufacture a thought like that at a moment like this, because it was clear to me that my life was gone. It was done. It was over. No pilot at Northwest who had been involved in alcohol had ever come back. Their situations weren't even 10% as bad as mine was or was going to get. And they were done. They were finished and they were done. And I knew that there would be no coming back from this. It was just not possible. So I didn't have an ounce of hope. I didn't go in the treatment center with the idea that it would look good to a judge or it would look good to my employer or that maybe I could get a job back or maybe I could fly again. I was done. I was through. I knew it. I just knew it. It was over. And I had no hope. No hope. And uh, I'd kind of like to stop at this point and break it up and tell you a few years ago, March 9th rolled around and it was a gorgeous day here where we live. One of my sponsees surprised me. We live out a little ways and he pulled up in the driveway and I said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I heard the story. I know it's March the 9th. I just want to come by and wish you and Barbara uh, happy anniversary. So we went inside. And she had coffee on. And it was early in the morning. It was about nine. And we're sitting there talking. And he said, well, what's the secret for having stayed married for so long? And before I had a chance to respond, Barbara said, um, well, I think it's mostly due to the fact that I could just never stand to admit that I'd made a mistake. And I thought about that. And I thought, you know, we talk about character defects. And I try to encourage hers. And as long as she maintains that one, I'll probably stay married for another day or two and have a place to sleep. So if she ever gets to the point where she can acknowledge her mistake, we, we, I may have a problem. But March coming up here shortly will be number 60 for us. So she's hung around for a long time just because she couldn't admit she made a mistake. I was uh, born in Wichita, Kansas, right in the middle of the United States. And I lived on the southeast edge of Wichita in a World War II housing project, which was not a very pretty place. All of us were, it was a very economically depressed area. All of us were pretty much the same. No, Nobody there had much in the way of money. And everything we had was used and secondhand and broken and taped and wired. And But my memories are very, very good of my time in Plainview. That was temporary housing. It was built during World War II and not supposed to last and still there today. And it wasn't a very pretty place, but we were all the same. I had no way of knowing that that, uh, that we were poor. And I rem- all my kid, all my friends were the same way. And uh, I had happy memories there. And it was a very diverse community. There were blacks and whites and um, Hispanics and a few Native American, small Native American segment. I was part of that. I'm a mix of about four different things, but the parts that really like the alcohol are the Irish and the uh, Comanche parts. And uh, I was very active in my Native culture. That became the strongest part of my identity. I was a powwow dancer. I was all over Oklahoma at the powwows. I was very heavily involved in my culture. And, um, and, and I, you know, and I saw a lot of drinking there. I saw an awful lot of drunk Indians. I never saw any sober Indians. That's not so today. There's, it's still a problem. Uh, alcohol has been the greatest ethnic cleanser that Europeans ever brought to this country in the native community. But there is a movement underfoot now called Red Road, of which AA is the is core central part of it. AA is the backbone of that pro, uh, uh, program which is interspersed with Native American spirituality and medicine wheel and a number of other things that are traditional Native American beliefs and traditions. And I'm active in that program as well. <clears throat> but when I was um, 14, the alcohol had really destroyed my family and my parents got a divorce. And within in the next three years, uh, yeah, next three years, each of them were married and divorced two more times. And I didn't get along very well in blended families with stepbrothers and stepsisters. And I don't remember any of them. I wouldn't know if one of them came in. If I passed one of them on the street, I wouldn't know who they were. And so I bounced from family to family when trouble would erupt. And that's kind of how I went through high school. I never talk about this when I mention my parents without also t- saying that I owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude because before the alcohol killed them, they were not drunk all the time. And before the alcohol killed them, they gave me and my sister an awful lot of good things that uh, have stood us in good stead all these years. One of them is a work ethic. I have a tremendous work ethic, and there's and I will do whatever I have to do to get the job done. And I don't care how dirty or sweaty or grimy I have to get. If it's if it's needed, I'll do it. I will do it in order to get where I needed to be. 
and that uh, and so I owe my parents a, a, a debt of gratitude for that. The other thing I was fortunate in is that uh, even though both of them were alcoholics, I never experienced any domestic violence. That's a big deal uh, because you hear it in an awful lot of stories. But I never, my dad never beat my mom. I never had to witness that. I never had to get involved in that. Uh, there was a lot. There was no screaming and yelling. But it was a, it was a just a typical alcoholic home, and where that uh, that undercurrent of alcoholism was always palpable. I could feel it. It was there. And I could never take friends over because I didn't know which of the two or whether or not both of them would be drunk. And it was always, it was embarrassing stuff that happened. And so I just couldn't, I could not take friends over there. So anyway, as this was going on, I was going through high school, bouncing from family to family. And I graduated when I was 17 and uh, had decided uh, not too many people from where I came from went to college. Some did. But um, most of them married their little high school sweetheart and went to work in one of the aircraft factories that Wichita is known for, the Boeing Beach Cessna. And there were a couple more there at that time, and I didn't had no interest in doing that. So I was going to join the service. And one of my buddies came back from the Marine Corps, right out of boot camp, fresh out of boot camp. And I was really impressed. And I sat with him for an hour, and he told me all about the Marine Corps, about uh, boot camp. And these were cruel, brutal, sadistic stories about what Marine drill instructors do to their recruits. And I had just turned 18, and I'm hanging on every word, and I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I need to go do that. And so within a few days, I'd signed on the dotted line, and off I went. And I hear an awful lot of speakers say I never fit in. That's not my story. I got to Marine Corps boot camp. Once I got over the initial shock of it, and it was a, there was a shock involved in, in making that transition from a barely 18-year-old kid into Marine Corps. Uh, once I got over the shock of that, I settled into it very well. And it was intense, and it was demanding, and it was extreme. Marine Corps boot camp is not like the other services, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I just mean that as a factual statement. But once I got in there, I, I experienced that thing that the Marine Corps is known for, which is that brotherhood, that sense of camaraderie, that esprit de corps, that special something about being a Marine that tied me so closely and tightly to every other Marine around me. And I had never experienced that before. And it captured me, and I said, this is where I belong, and this is where I'm going to stay. <clears throat> As we came up on our 13th week, all I wanted to do really was survive the boot camp training, because some didn't, and uh, a number of them didn't. But um, as we came up on the final 13th week, the drill instructors called out three names of the top guys in the platoon, and my name was the second name called. <clears throat> I, uh, I was astounded by that. I just wanted to survive, and I had no idea I was doing that well. So I make I, I make my first rank, private first class, and you can't run the Marine Corps as a private first class. But I'll tell you what, I had never achieved or accomplished anything like that, especially under those kind of conditions. And I had a red border stripe on my shirt, and my buddies had nothing. They were still privates. And that, that was a meaningful thing, that, that one stripe. Not much, but boy, did it have meaning to me. <clears throat> my, next pro, my next promotion was meritorious at all. I always did well. I always achieved. One of the things I'm not going to have time for in this story that I'm telling you is a big, long drunk log, and I've got one. I could spend the time talking about it or I can get through the rest of this story. <clears throat> My drunk log parallels most of the ones that I've heard. We drink in all kinds of different ways, different our drinking pad. I can go to an AA conference with 32 years of sobriety, and I can sit there and I can pick out the differences. I never hid the bottle. I never hid the bottle. I never, uh, I didn't drink in the mornings, and I was convinced all alcoholics drank in the mornings. <clears throat> I didn't beat or abuse my wife or kids. Uh, I didn't do an awful lot of things that I hear other alcoholics talk about when they go through their stories. And yet I'm an alcoholic through and through, because it's not how we drink or how often we drink or when we, it, none of, what I listen for in the stories is what happened to that person. And I always hear it whether they're young, old, red, white, black, yellow, whatever color, <clears throat> and the loss and the shame and the loss of self that this disease brings and what happens to that person. And then I listen for the recovery to kick in, and I see what happens when that occurs as well. And when I do that, I always hear my story because I always identify with that particular person because I know what that feels like, and that's what I listen for. <clears throat> At any rate, um, I was doing well in the Marine Corps. I'm drinking hard. I'm on. 
One of the things I don't remember, and I know this is a, a fault in a memory, but I, I cannot remember. Um, as I look back, I do not remember ever just drinking socially. I do not remember ever being in a crowd of people and having two, three, four, five drinks and calling it a night. I just don't remember that. Because when I start to drink, I will drink until the bar closes or the bottle's empty. Because it seems like the thing to do. Because if I'm feeling good now, I'm going to feel really good if I just keep pushing it. And I always do that. I always drink. And I never, I will never voluntarily stop. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. I just thought I was a hard drinker. I saw, I saw nothing troubling about that. And I'm with people that are drinking, for the most part, pretty much like I am. And that was true all up throughout my lifetime until finally it wasn't true. And I remember the evening when I noticed that. At any rate, uh, I've been in the Marine Corps about four and a half years, and my drill instructor, or my uh, company commanding officer, called me in. He said, "There's a new program out called Marine Aviation Cadet," and he said, "You just happen to be the only guy in this unit, this entire unit, whose entry scores are at a level at high enough to go test for that program. If you think you'd like to fly airplanes, well, I'd always wanted to, but that was uh, that was a distant thought." Pilots had to have college, I thought. They certainly didn't come out of Plainview, that part of Wichita. They didn't come out of an alcoholic home, and they didn't come out of the Native community. But suddenly, I've got an opportunity to go take a test, so I did. And I tested and passed. And he called me back in. He said, there's some things you need to know. He said, you're coming in the back door because you're an enlisted Marine, and you took a test that's going to let you get into this program. But he said 98 99% of the people you'll be in there with coming in from the civilian side, all have to have two years college minimum. And most of them will have more than that. And on average, roughly half of them don't make it over the, over the course of the 18 months. And so I knew that I was starting off way behind from an educational standpoint, and I stood a good chance of being in the 50% that don't make it. And I said, I want to try. So I went home to Wichita. <clears throat> I'm going to Pensacola the next day, Pensacola, Florida, to start flight training. And there was a power, and they called for an honoring dance for me because this was really something special. I'm heading off into a, a beautiful career as a, as a pilot. And so they honored me with this dance, and I went out and led the dance. And for the next 18 months, that really impacted me because I kept thinking there's no way. I mean, I, I was determined that I could not go back to the Native community as a failure because none of them had this opportunity that was being laid in front of me. And if I went back and I told them I had failed, I'd flunked out, I'd washed out, uh, I just couldn't stand that. And so I was driven with that for those 18 months. And in those 18 months, <laughs> there were four major uh, phases of flight training. And in every one of those phases, I ended up as a number two guy. I was always surprised by it. I never, ever felt cocky or confident or complacent. And I'm watching my friends wash out weekly, sometimes daily. And washing out is, is a, an excruciating experience because they come to me with a sea bag over their shoulder to say their goodbyes, and they want the, they want those wings as much as I did. And for some reason, they're not going to be able to do it. And they're leaving. And their dreams are over, their hearts are broken, and they're just shattered. And I watch them walk away. I don't remember any of them ever looking at my eyes, raising their eyes as they said their goodbyes. And every time they leave, I think, before this is over, that will be me. But I kept put, moving ahead, working hard. In the final six months, I went to Beeville, Texas, <clears throat> for the advanced jet flight training, leaving the Florida area. The afternoon I got in there it was a Friday, and I went to the officers' club with a bunch of friends, and we had reunited, and we all got drunk, and we went into a little drive-in uh, in Beeville where the girls hung out, and they went after a carload of girls. I kind of hung back a little bit. I'm still having some drinks, and I'm, I, I need some a little bit more of that false courage before I make my approach. Driver wasn't talking to anybody, and I couldn't get a real good look at her, but I had rehearsed some things to say, so I approached the car, and I remember thinking, man, I got some really good stuff tonight. It's better than most of my stuff is, and she, she may just take her clothes off sitting there. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I went up there, and she turned and looked at me, and she was a really pretty girl, really pretty girl. And every thought I had had just vacated. I had nothing to say. I had no thoughts remaining. And I'm standing there kind of flat-footed. And I, I tried to comment. She had really pretty brown eyes. And what came out was all sideways. I was trying to say, you've got beautiful eyes or something like that. And it kind of came out. Was, 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 something like that. I couldn't even, I didn't even understand what I was saying. 
And she looked at me like I just peed on the side of her car. And I was embarrassed. And I turned around and walked away. And I thought, I'm not going back. <laughs> and uh, a little while later, I'm standing back there drinking some more. I see her get out and walk into the restroom. And I got a good look at her. She had a cute little rear end on her. And she had turquoise shorts and pretty legs. And I actually had an AA thought during the time that I watched her walk in there. I didn't know it was an AA thought. I recognized about 29 years later, though, because... As she's walking in there, I'm looking at her thinking, man, I really want what she has, and I'm willing to go to any lengths to get it. So I had a chance encounter with her the next day, and um, she had a girlfriend. I had a buddy with me, and uh, I was a little scared and nervous, but she let me buy her a cup of coffee and told me her name was Barbara. And on February the 25th of 1963, her 20th birthday, she pinned that set of gold wings on me, right over my heart, those two gold bars on my shoulder. It had been six years since I'd entered the Marine Corps as a barely 18-year-old kid private. I am now a commissioned Marine Corps officer, a fighter pilot, and I've got a set of gold wings. Man, I tell you, Hollywood couldn't have scripted a better day. And I've got this good-looking girl who thinks I'm okay. Went home to Wichita for three weeks. She stayed with my sister. And as the leave's coming to an end, I called her and said, you're going home to Texas. I've got orders to California. Let's get married. So we ran down to a small town just south of the state line called Newkirk, Oklahoma, and stood in front of a justice of the peace while another couple loaned us their rings for the ceremony. We got married on March the 9th, 1963. We will have 60 years coming up on March the 9th of 2023. We've had a wonderful marriage, a wonderful time. We've, we've got a rich history together, and you're, gonna, you're hearing about a little bit about it. I was, um, I went to, um, we immediately had two kids, two boys, eight days less than a year apart. And she went home to Texas and, uh, from California. And I headed for Vietnam. We were one of the first Marine squadrons in Vietnam, flying, uh, 50 miles south of Da Nang out of a brand new little airstrip built. It was still being built by the Seabees, living in tents and sand and eating sea rations out of little cans. The runway was half of what we needed. We used jet assist bottles for takeoff. We flew combat operations. Living and temperatures were 100, 110 degrees. <clears throat> all of our landings were back into carrier gear because we're all carrier qualified. And it was an intense combat experience. And we acquitted ourselves extraordinarily well over there. And I was with 28 of the finest men, the finest pilots, and the finest officers that I think the Marine Corps ever put together in one place. And I look back on that and I think, what a place of honor I was. I got to fly right in the middle. of I got to be right in the middle of those guys and be one of them and fly with them. And I'll never have another experience like that in my lifetime. <clears throat> I put in for a regular commission, which would guarantee me a, a career in the Marine Corps. They're very competitive. And I knew when I filled out the paperwork, it wasn't going to go through because a regular commission was reserved for officers who had college degrees. And I had none. Or they were, had significant college. And like I say, they were highly competitive at that point in time. And guess what? I got a regular commission. And that's kind of what I'm supposed to do. That's, that's the expectation I have of me. And that's kind of, I think, the expectation others have. I'm not supposed to go into Fargo, North Dakota in a bar and become the greatest pariah in all of American commercial aviation. No pilot before or since has hit the perfect storm in the same way that I did. No pilot has ever done the damage that I did to an airline or to the profession in, in the way that I did it. And I'm not happy about that, and I'm not proud of it. But you know what? I own it. I own it. I, um, I, it just, I, had, I don't have the power to have my intentions and, and all of my desires override the power of this disease. Sooner or later, it, it gets the best of me. And it did. It did. <clears throat> and um, I, got, I stayed in the Marine Corps for 11 and a half years. And I finally decided to get out because the family separation was going to be required if I finished my flying. I was going to stay till I either couldn't fly or I died. But I had promised Barbara that we will never have a family that's not a really solid, safe family. And I saw that I was going. To, I could not be away from my kids for between four and six more years, and, and maintain that promise. So I got out of the Marine Corps. Three weeks after I got out, I was in class at Northwest Airlines, and for 22 years I had the same kind of a uh, situation at Northwest. I loved the flying. I loved flying with the people I flew with. I loved the people in the back, the flight attendants. It was a fun job. I couldn't wait to go to work. 
Well, we all played and partied. And um, throughout this, my, my drinking is escalating. But it's also, it's, I'm with people that are drinking pretty much the same way I am. Later, that stopped. You know, today, when I go to a Marine Corps function or a retirement party for the airline, they, they don't drink the same way I used to drink because they're normal drinkers and they slowed down. Age has taken and slowed that, that down. Uh, but I wasn't slowing down. I was accelerating, continuing to accelerate. When we got to the airline, Barbara decided she wanted a daughter. So we put in for an adoption. We had the two biological boys, so it required an awful lot of hard work on our part because they they were re reluctant to do that. We fought hard for 14 months, and we bring home this little girl. She was 17 days old, little Indian girl, most beautiful little girl I have ever seen in my life. And I suddenly found out what little girls do to their dads. I had the two boys, and I loved my two boys. But when that little girl came in, she became the center of my universe. I mean, she took over my heart. And I loved her so much. I loved her so much. I was so proud and happy with her. And uh, when she was 17, she ran away from home. And I didn't see it coming. Didn't know it was coming, neither did Barbara. I don't know if I not, hadn't been drinking, if it would have happened or not. You know, here's the thing. You know, I didn't drink every night. <clears throat> and I, I never beat or abused my wife or kids. And I never drank in the mornings. Ironically, I never done any drugs, not even experimentally. I didn't even smoke cigarettes. I just liked to drink. And I'd tell my friends that later, I said, I don't know why you would smoke a cigarette in one hand and have a drink in the other hand when you could have a drink in both hands. So I, I didn't think I had a problem. Didn't get drunk every weekend. But when I drink, I drink. And when I drink, I get drunk. But I'm a happy drunk. I'm not a mean, vicious drunk. Now, that can change in a bar. If somebody bumps me or do, does something that upsets me, that can change real quickly. But for the most part, I'm a happy drunk. I give away the store when I'm drunk. I get really generous. <clears throat> but I'd put off being a captain for two years because I wanted to be there while she graduated from high school and not be gone all the time. So she was coming up on graduation. I went to Chicago to take a special written test. That afternoon when Barbara took me to the airport, Barbara took some things of hers, left a note, and ran away. I heard about it the next morning when I called home to go and come home, and I panicked. I didn't know what had happened to this little girl that I loved so much. It was a two-hour flight from Chicago back to Atlanta, and by the time I got off the airplane, something had happened, and I will never understand what, why, when, or how. But when I got off the airplane, I was no longer afraid for my daughter. I hated her. I hated her in, with a way, in a way that I didn't know that I even possessed it for hatred. And I told Barbara, I said, I don't care if she dies in the street. She'll never come back to my house to live. And I never want her name mentioned in my presence for the rest of my life. And within two days, there was no physical trace she'd ever been in my house. Everything she'd ever owned had gone to Goodwill. <clears throat> I went to the bank. I ripped up her adoption papers. I went to an attorney and gave him $500 and disowned her. Then I tried to annul the adoption and couldn't. And in the midst of all this fevered activity, this hatred, this just insanity, I looked around and the way only an alcoholic could do it. And I thought, you know, I don't think Barbara's handling this too well. She probably needs a therapist. So I got in the yellow pages. By the luck of the draw, I got a, a PhD family therapist. And he was the man that I talked to that morning when I came home. We saw him twice a, a month for almost two years. One time when he was trying to get me to talk about my daughter, I made a statement that I had never consciously formed or fashioned to the best of my ability. And I looked at him and said, I'm going to tell you something, doctor. I said, I would rather hate than hurt. And he said, you survived a childhood doing that. If you continue, it'll destroy you. And that's what I had discovered. I discovered that I will never feel pain if I feel anger ahead of pain. When my anger raises to the height and the width and the depth, I will not feel pain because I won't experience it because I'm too busy with anger. And that became my one and only coping tool, my blocking tool. And I was completely unaware of that. I didn't know that. I just knew that it worked. And as a result of that, I did some things that were very, very cruel to Barbara. And she was the first person I had to make an amend to. And I've never done those things since then. <clears throat> a week to the day, uh, that's kind of where we were when I got rested. But I need to tell you that the alcohol quit working for me. All I want to do now on layovers is drink. I don't want to go out with the cruise anymore. I don't want to go out for dinner or fun times. 
I know where every liquor store is in every city and town in this United States that we fly into. And I know how long it takes me to change clothes, get up there, get a quart of alcohol, <clears throat> get back to my room, lock the door, turn the TV on. I don't go to the door if somebody knocks. I don't answer the phone if they call. I sit in there and I drink. And I go through that alcohol, that quart, pretty fast because I mix them stiff. But I never able, I never ever got that feeling that alcohol had always given me, that feeling that every one of you knows that I'm, I don't have to deal with a lot of description. You know what I'm talking about. And I could never recover. I wanted that warmth. I wanted that freedom. I wanted that escape. I wanted that feeling that it's okay and I don't care. And I because from that time on, every time I mixed a drink and threw it down, it was like it was gasoline hitting a fire in my belly. And up came the hatred and the bitterness and the self-pity and the martyrdom, and this long list of all these things that I had done for this little girl, and look how she had repaid me. And when I get to the end of the bottle, which doesn't take me real long, I am emotionally wasted, tired, and exhausted. I'm tired. I have no relief. It's worse. And yet, the next night in a different town, I will do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And the booze, the alcohol, never ever gave me the relief that I was after. Not ever after that. So that's where we were when I was arrested. I go into this treatment center, and I don't want anybody to know who I am or what I am. And within about the second day, it's all over news, and now everybody knows. A week to the day that I went into treatment, they had announced on TV, they had two TVs in this treatment center. I wouldn't go near either one of them because I'm all over the news. <laughs> and... A week to the day that I went in there, they announced that Northwest Airlines had terminated me, which they should have, that the FAA had issued an emergency revocation, <clears throat> an emergency revocation of all my flight licenses and certificates, and they should have. And I've lost my FAA medical because of my alcoholism diagnosis. And I'm stripped naked of all my professional credentials. The only thing I knew how to do, fly an airplane, and I have no education to fall back on. So I'm done. I'm all done. About that same time, I go into a room, group therapy, and about eight or ten people. They close the door, and talking is counterintuitive to me. But for some reason, that day, I began to talk about my daughter, and I no longer had that anger and that hatred. And so I felt the pain. It hit me right in the heart, and it, and it broke me. And I sobbed in front of this group. I didn't cry. I just did not cry. I didn't cry at my parents' funerals. But that day, I did. And then I felt naked and embarrassed. Later, I looked at that and I go, that was one of the greatest gifts I've had in treatment because for the first time in a long time, I'm starting to recapture those feelings that God gave me when I came out of the womb. Feelings that I had shut down and stopped and blunted over the course of a lifetime. And they're returning and I, I'm experiencing that. And I got a hold of Barbara and said, let's put the family back together again. There was no phone calls, no, no visitors at this treatment center. And they said, we'll give you a day room if you can make it happen. And some days later, <clears throat> I walked into this day room. The two doctors were off to my left. They asked if they could please come watch this. I walked in and I looked at my daughter for the first time in two years. And she was smaller than I remembered. My two sons were there. Barbara was there. And I walked in and I put my arms around my little girl and told her how much I loved her instead of how much I hated her. And her arms was a five-month-old granddaughter that I didn't know anything about. My daughter had gotten married and I didn't even know her last name. And I told my kids at that point, I said, things are happening and you need to start planning on seeing your dad handcuffed on television and led away to prison. Because now legal things are coming to me. And so they did it six times, about a day or two days apart. And it would just absolutely suffocate me. I mean, it was like every time they take me out of a room, it was like they sucked the air out of the room and I couldn't breathe. Suddenly, Minnesota's indicting me. They're going to, uh, uh, it's going to be a 90 day in jail misdemeanor. 90 days in jail, I couldn't do 90 days in jail. I'd never been in jail. The only time I thought I'd be locked up was uh, if I was shot down in Vietnam as a POW. Then North Dakota comes into the act. Then they double the charges. Then the federal marshals are Marshals are coming to take me out of treatment in handcuffs for an arraignment. And every time they do this, I'm suffering. I, I'm, I'm working so hard on this acceptance thing, and I feel like I'm failing. And my counselor finally says, no, with every new event, as, as all of this escalates, you will have to rise to a new level of acceptance. And I didn't know if I could do that. I just didn't know if I could do that. And finally, they take me out, of, and there's a doctor standing there when I come out of the group room. And he takes me down. And he said, I have to tell you, and my counselor's down there. 
He said, you're looking at 15 years in federal prison, a $250,000 fine, and an attorney's coming in Sunday and wants $50,000. We'd gone broke within 30 days of the arrest. I'd, I'd grown up that way. Now I've taken Barbara with me. I don't have the money. I can't do it. And he said, I have to ask if you hurt yourself. And I said, no. I went back to my room, just numbed out. And I collapsed and my, was, my head was on the carpet. I was crying for the second time in treatment. And I simply said this, God, I can't do this anymore. I don't have anything left. I've got nothing left. I can't even do it one more time. Please, please help me. And I slept that night. That was my prayer. Please, please help me. I slept that night. I had many, many experiences in treatment that I don't have time for. I'm trying to get through this story. And in the time that I'm talking about it, you've heard, you'll hear about 30% of the entire story. <clears throat> I, I, I really bought into the big book. For the first time, I'm listening. I started listening because my life was such that, you know, I had been beaten into that state of reasonableness. And I want to really believe this. I really want to believe about the 12 steps. I really want to believe that big book. And I really want to believe the 12 and 12. But I don't know. I don't know. I hope. And I've got nothing left to count on. So I, I, I bet on it. And it was a good bet because it does work. I have a job to do. All of us have a part to play in this program, in this process. We hear it, God will do for us what we could not do for ourselves. But the part that's not said is that God will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. And I can't sit on my butt and just wait for things to happen. I cannot, the 12 steps does not say that I need to do that or that I can do that. And if I do my part in this program, in this process, in this fellowship, if I get a sponsor, if I get a home group, if I work the steps with a sponsor, if I try to do some service work, if I just try to help another alcoholic, no matter how it happens, day in, day out, if I do that part, I'm doing my part, and this program and those promises will come true. And they'll be different for all of us, but they will happen. Rarely have we seen a person fail. Well, they were going to say never. And they said, rarely, I've never seen a person fail. And I'll say this, and it's a controversial statement. I've never seen anyone who can't get sober. What I have seen are probably 500 relapses of people who won't get sober. We're fond of saying, well, he just couldn't get sober, so he died. And I've known 50 of those people, families and friends. And if I put the people in AA uh, casually, that number goes way up. We don't ask people to do anything that they can't do. We ask people to do things they won't do. You don't have to have a Mensa IQ in this fellowship to get sober. And you don't have to have Olympic athletic skills to get sober. All you have to do are some things that we don't want to do. And when I looked at those 12 steps, there wasn't one of them I wanted to do. There wasn't one of them I thought, that's going to be fun. But I did them because they told me if I wanted to get sober, I would do those. And I want to get sober. So people come in and they say, well, I'm not going to do this. I'll do two of this. This isn't a buffet. You don't get to do a double amount of step three and a double amount of step one, skip four and five, and then go to nine. You, you can't do You can do it, but it's not going to work. I've never seen it work. So if you want to get sober, you do it the real way. It's all or nothing. And that's the way I went at it. <clears throat> I was immediately in a heavily publicized three-week trial. We do the toughest judge in the Minnesota Federal District. Never got a break anywhere. Never got a break anywhere. And there were precious few times when it could go one way or the other. And I'd pray it would go to the right and it'd always go to the left or vice versa. So, and I'm the captain, so everything comes to me first. And I had an amazing story with an attorney. Don't have time for that. The um, I wanted to plead guilty. He talked me out of for reasons that made sense. They banged on me in treatment. You're going to have to learn to listen and you're going to have to learn to trust. And so I did. And I told him, I said, I'll be found guilty. And when I am, I want you to know that it will be okay. I had an advantage over the other two guys because I'm the alcoholic. That means I can go to an AA meeting at night. I can go in there and I can absorb the power that's in the air. They can't, but I can. And if we weren't involved in legal stuff, I did. And at first it was scary because I'm all over the news. And the minute I walk into an AA room, they know exactly who I am. And I don't sit in there and share, but I sit in there and I absorb the power that's in the air and I take it to the courtroom the next day and it works. Sometimes when they're painting me as the biggest black guard in the entire world, I look across the room and I see Barbara and she meets my eye and she mouths the words, I love you. And I would nod and I would be okay. And I would just nod. It'd be okay. 
And that's how I went through the trial. The jury goes out and the jury comes back. You know, we see these legal things and they get drawn out for a year, two years, three years, not mine. I was arrested in March. I was in a courtroom, federal courtroom in July and August. I was sentenced in October and I was in prison in December. So my thing driven by this tremendous amount of public pressure went very, very quickly. And, and so anyway, the jury comes back the jury comes very, uh, they go out, they come back very quickly. I know what that probably means. So I'm standing up and I'm the first one and I hear uh, guilty and my attorney flinched and I just reached over and patted him. I said, it's okay. It's okay. We go back a month later for the sentencing. Sentencing guidelines were 12 to 18 months. I've been in treatment with a federal judge. And he said, I got to tell you, he said, the sentencing is a charade. He told me a lot of stuff I just assumed not, not have known. But he says, the sentencing is a charade. He said, you'll talk, your attorney will talk. But he said, the minute we walk in the courtroom, that sentence is set and we never change from the bench. And there have been judges around the courtroom over the course of the years that have confirmed, uh, confirmed that, corroborated that. They said, that's true. We never come, we never change. It's just a facade. That part's a facade. A day and a half before three, uh, before sentencing, my attorney got me and he says, the judge has just announced to the other two attorneys and to the media that he's going to depart upwards from the uh, sideline or the guidelines. And he has strong feelings about this case, which I saw. And he was entitled to those feelings because I had been guilty of a horrific betrayal of the public trust, period. I made no excuses and I knew it. And I thought to myself, oh man, this is going to be big. So I walked into the courtroom that morning and I gave Barbara my personal effects. I said, I don't think I'll be coming back. And he lectured for half an hour about what he was getting ready to do. And I was the first one to stand. And I just, and my statement was, I didn't know what I was going to say. I, I was grateful to be sober. I was grateful for what had happened inside my family with my daughter. And I'd accepted responsibility for this from day one. I made no excuses. There wasn't anything I could do about it. And he announced a sentence on me of 16 months, two months less under the guidelines. Blew everybody away. I knew something had happened that morning. I didn't think I'd ever find out what or how. And then I found out later that he was going to sentence me to four years in prison, and he actually changed from the bench. To this day, the other two guys don't know they were headed for three years because I got 25% more than they did. Then he said, I'm going to let you men remain free until your appeals are exhausted because this is a complex legal situation. It was not designed for pilots. The other two took that offer. I said, no, I'll go now. The judge later told my attorney, he said, I've never, he said, I was lost for words. He said, I, I've never had a defendant before or since do that. Why did I do it? Because I learned in here that we deal with life on life's terms, not mine, but life's terms. And I'm not going to stay out for a year, year and a half. Every night when the sun goes down, I'm one day closer to what's going to happen. I'm not going to do that. And I, I remember that a coward dies a thousand deaths, a brave man only one. And I'm not going to die a thousand deaths every night when the sun goes down and I'm one day closer to what's eventually going to happen. I told my kids, I said, I've never gone to a penitentiary before, so I'm scared. But I also remember something in the Marine Corps that I'd learned. The courage is not the absence of fear. It's the ability to continue in the face of it. And I told him, I can't come out the back door till I walk in the front. So I'm walking in the front now. And on December the 5th, 1990, 34 years to the day that I'd entered Marine Corps boot camp, I became inmate 04478-041. I spent 424 days in the correction system, the prison system. Had a, I said that one time from the podium, a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, 424 days. I said, yeah. He said, he said, man, that's, he said, that's nothing. He said, I was out there 18 years. And I just looked at him and smiled. I said, well, I guess you win. <clears throat> but that was a long time for me. The judge had put sanctions on, on top of everything that uh, the FAA had done. I was never, I was the most, they were going to make sure that I never, ever, ever, ever flew again. And so he put sanctions on me to guarantee that. And in another story I don't have time for, I'd gotten out of prison about a year later, he lifted those sanctions. Not one chance in 10,000 he would do that, but he did. And then the FAA said to me, if you want to fly again, you'll do it literally from the ground up with a private license. I'd never had a private license. I'd come out of the Marine Corps and been given a commercial license with an instrument rating. I held the highest license uh, available in aviation. It was kind of the PhD of aviation called the ATP. I thought if I could re if I, if I had to go through that again and I could perform to the highest of standards, certainly they waive the lower ones. No, you're going to do a private, a commercial, an instrument, then an ATP. No pilot thought that was possible. And I do everything in here one day at a time, so I do them one license at a time. Ten and a half months later, I'd pass the written on all four licenses, and that's a short statement about a long, hard, difficult journey. 
But I told you, I've got a work ethic and I will do it. But there's a flying part that goes with each one of those sections. I couldn't do it. I'm now back out of prison. I'm still in the halfway house for a lot of this. <clears throat> and I'm working at the treatment center that saved my life. And I'm working in the counseling department. And you know what I'm making? $14,000 a year. $14,000 a year. And I'm grateful for the job. That's my attitude. I'm grateful to have that job. I don't know how we survived almost two years like that. I just don't know how we survived, but we did. I can't do the flying part. And about that time, a pilot gets a hold of me and he says, you didn't know it, but I got a flight school 50 miles north of the Twin Cities in Buffalo, Minnesota. I want you to come up and live with me and my family for free and go through the license, the flight school for free. And I want you to get your tickets back. So I went up there and I lived with that man and his family for 44 days. Rained out 14 days and never slowed down, never quit studying. Remaining 30 days, I flew 78 hours in a little airplane. That's an awful lot of flying. I got four licenses back, two of them by 11.15 one morning. I don't think that's ever been done. When I'm not night flying, I'm in an AA meeting, either in Buffalo or one of those small farming communities that's right around there. Why? Because that's where I go. Why? Because AA is the one that's given me a lot of my life back. And so that's where I go. A lot different from 1975 when I thought it was a cult and I hated it. AA is where I need to go. And if I had missed it, I would have missed the whole show. <clears throat> I came back with four licenses, and I thought, I'll never fly on American soil, and I told Barbara that. Because my publicity has been, had been so strong. I'm a federal felon, and they've got in the headlines and the subtitles, alcoholic. It's all over the place. I never had any anonymity. <clears throat> Nobody's going to hire me. And about a month after I'd gotten home, the licenses physically came in the mail. I got a phone call within an hour telling me and it was the head of the pilot union. The grievance had been automatically act, uh, ter, uh, filed because of my termination. I'd not activated it because I wasn't going to fight my arrest. I mean, fight the determination. North was fully justified in terminating me. And this man said, this is the best phone call I've ever made because he said three hours ago, John Dasper, president and CEO of Northwest Airlines, a man I had never even seen. Made a, full uh, made a decision to bring him back and pitch in full flight status at Northwest. I could not believe the words coming through the phone. If a pilot's airline is mentioned one time publicly, he's done. I had mentioned, my airline had been mentioned dozens of times, egregiously dragged through the mud, and a lot of it by Jay Leno, who called me in June of 96 and talked to me and apologized to me. It's another story I don't have time for. <clears throat> but my airline had been so badly bludgeoned and I could not believe this man is going to bring me back and let me fly again. Then I find out later that his dad's an alcoholic who can't stay sober. And I'm thinking, my God, the courage to anticipate this public backlash that's going to come, which didn't come. <clears throat> but if I had relapsed, the board of directors would have ousted him so fast he couldn't have packed his desk for letting me do it a second time after all the publicity and damage I'd caused. I could not believe he would risk that. And I told him so later when I went back. I said, I would never have done that. So I went back, signed a back-to-work agreement, never to be a captain again. And I'm fine with that. I was fine with that. But even that changed because now I'm, I want to be the best employee. I always had a great reputation as a pilot, but now I want one as an employee. I want to be the best employee on the property because I'm certainly the most visible. <clears throat> and I was coming up on my last year at Northwest. I was speaking at United Airlines, and I got a phone call late at night. Barbara was with me. Same pilot. And he said, guess what? John Dasberg knows you're coming up on your last year at Northwest. He has just personally changed your back to work agreement because he thinks when you come back to Northwest after where you're at, you need to be a 747 captain for the last year that you're here. Can you imagine that? Can you even imagine that? I couldn't. So I went back and I checked out and I spent the last year in the left seat of a 747 giving back the first thing we lose and the most golden gift of all, trust. Whether it's a wife trusting a husband, their kids trusting their dad, or an employer trusting their employee, trust is just, uh, you can't buy it with money. And I had been given that back. And he put me in an airplane that was mega million dollars, let me fly all over the world with flight attendants and passengers because he trusted me. And he said publicly, because I was a public, because I was a sober member of A, I have no special qualities. The best part of my story is that I don't get any credit for it. All I ever did was what every one of us is asked to do when we come into AA. That's all I ever did. And now suddenly these things come to me and I never knew when they were coming. I never had any inkling they were going to happen. And I retired 
is the mandatory retirement age then of 60, 1998. And within a day or so, my this is now eight years after the trial, my attorney called me. He said, Judge Rosenbaum is chief judge up here in the federal uh, district. And he just called me and said, in 16 years, he's never supported a petition for pardon, but he'll support yours if you want to make the attempt. I had never even considered such a thing. He wrote a three-page affidavit that's over here in my safe. And if I had to sit here and read it in front of this audience, I'd have tears in my eyes by the time I get to page three. I cannot believe the chokingly powerful emotional things that the man says about me who tried me and sent me to prison. And this is what AA does. This is what recovery is about. This is what can happen when we get sober. <clears throat> Typically, my story ends on this high point. But life happens, no matter if we're sober or not. I don't know how many relapses. I've seen 500 probably at least. Last August, when I was sitting exactly where I am right now, the phone rang. It was from a neurologist. And he said, I have to tell you that Barbara's spinal tap fluid came back positive for Alzheimer's. And my world had just crumbled. And she walked in about that time. And I had to tell her. And I put my arms around her, and she had tears rolling down her cheeks. And she said, I just hope this isn't something I passed to our children. First thought out of her mouth was not about herself, but somebody else, which is exactly what she's been for 60 years. And at that point, I'm pretty raw. And I said, honey, I'd give anything if it was me instead of you. And she said, oh, no. Oh, no. She said, you'll be able to get along without me, but I could never get along without you. So we're doing some things that are outside the box. I don't know if we'll win or not. The courage to change the things we can. I know what the school solution is on Alzheimer's, and I'm not going to sit and do nothing because that's an Alzheimer's death. Within four to eight years of the time of diagnosis, they die. They got four drugs roughly that'll slow it down, but that's all. <clears throat> so we're going to fight the fight. We'll fight the fight, and we will accept the outcome. There's a story that says nothing in God's world happens by mistake. I believe that, but I don't believe that translates to God causes everything that happens. If I believe, and people go, well, it's God's will. Well, I don't, you can believe that if you want to. I don't believe that. I think God had tears in his eyes the same afternoon I did. And if I thought there was a God up there that says, I think I'll infl uh, inflict down some hideous disease on an innocent baby just so the parents could suffer, or I think I'll take that beautiful Barbara who's never hurt another human soul in her entire lifetime and give her Alzheimer's, I could never utter another prayer. And there are people that will blame God for these sorts of things. And if I blame God, then he becomes my problem, and he can never be my solution, and God is my solution. We will fight this fight, and we will accept the outcome. <clears throat> I want to close with something. And thank God I'm sober. 32, almost 33 years ago, she never flinched when I stood in, front of, in the middle of my life and burned it to the ground. And because I'm sober today, I have the honor and the privilege of being here for her and being 100% available emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually because I'm sober. And I intend to stay just exactly that. The idea of drinking again is a thousand miles beyond my zone of consideration. We'll have reasons to relapse, and I've got one, but I'll never have an excuse. I'll never have an excuse, not if I've done this program and am, am, and am invested in it the way I am. There's never a reason to drink. i am never an excuse. So I won't. I'll close with this. I do not wish you joys without a sorrow, nor endless day without the healing dark, a brilliant sun without the restful shadow, nor tides that never turn against your bark. I wish you faith and love and wisdom and goods, gold enough to help some needy one. I wish you songs, but also blessed silence and God's sweet peace when every day is done. My Comanche name, that's Barbara in the background. She's beautiful. She is so pretty and so kind and so sweet. My Comanche name is Yetzitanak, but you know me as Lyle. And I'm an alcoholic. So thanks for your time. Talk for an hour and eight minutes. And uh, thank you for my sobriety. I'm, 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 I'm privileged and honored and blessed to be here. So thank you. That's all I've got.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.